Good evening. Um, I'm Linda Partridge, the Biological Secretary and Vice President of the Royal Society, and it's my pleasure to introduce this year's Ferrier Medal and Lecture winner. Usually, of course, this lecture would take place live, but because of COVID, we're recording the lecture for online viewing, but we'll have a live question and answer session immediately afterwards when the transmission of the lecture is finished. So the Ferrier Medal and Lecture was created in the memory of neurologist and psychologist David Ferrier, FRS, and it was first awarded in 1928. And it's given on a subject related to the advancement of natural knowledge on the structure and function of the nervous system. And the medal itself is made of bronze. It's awarded every two years and it's accompanied by a gift of 2000 pounds. And the 2019 winner is Professor Ray Dolan. He's the Mary Kinross Professor of Neuropsychiatry and director of the Max Planck UCL Center for Computational Psychiatry and Aging. He trained in medicine in Ireland and completed his specialist training in psychiatry in the UK. And he was appointed as a consultant neuropsychiatrist to the National Hospital in Queen Square. And he was the founding director of the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Neuroimaging. His research interests include the neural mechanisms of reward, learning and decision making, and how impairments in these functions relate to neuropsychiatric disorders. He's a member of the Royal Irish Academy, a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and a fellow of the Royal Society. He's the recipient of numerous international awards, including the Minerva Foundation Golden Brain Award, the Max Planck International Research Award and the Brain Prize. And I would like to invite him now to give the 2019 Ferrier Lecture. Hello, um, I'm Ray Dolan and I'm delighted to be giving the Ferrier Lecture for 2019, giving it of course in 2020. Um, I thought I should start by saying a few things about David uh, Ferrier himself, um, who the prize commemorates. Ferrier made significant contributions to understanding representation in the brain. This included mapping sensory and motor areas of the cortex, providing precise localization of motor and sensory functions in the brain. In unique causal experiments, he used sporadic current to stimulate distinct cortical regions eliciting movements that resembled complex acts of writing, grasping, scratching. This established a cortical localization of action. In 1876, the same year that Mark Twain published Tom Sawyer and Robert Koch identified the anthrax bacillus, Ferrier published an acclaimed synthesis, The Functions of the Brain. I shared two things in common with Ferrier. Firstly, we were both appointed to the National Hospital, Queen Square. And secondly, we're both interested in action and its representation in the brain. My interest in action is more abstract than Ferrier's and relates to the field of decision-making. This is a huge and diverse field and encompasses disciplines such as ecology, artificial intelligence, economics and behavioral economics, psychology, and neuroscience. So the question you might wonder is how is action related to decision-making? In simple terms, decision-making can be thought of as an action selection that relies on an internal model. This model represents an action environment and action goals. A goal in this context refers to the attainment of positive value or its corollary, the avoidance of negative value. The idea of an action goal provides a link with an influential framing of decision-making in terms of reinforcement learning. In this, reinforcement learning is often considered under a duopoly of habit and goal-directed control. Habits, as shown on the left, refers to learning that uses real experience generated 
by interacting with the environment, one that adheres to what is called the law of effect associated with the figurehead of Edward Thorndike. In the example of the left, the co-occurrence of pressing a lever and getting cheese reinforces an action, rendering it more likely to occur in the future. This makes this type of control retrospective. Goal-directed control, as shown on the right, is associated with the figure of Edward Tolman. In the example on the left, a, an animal to perform a goal-directed action must have a prospective outlook and simulates experiences generated from an internal model of a task or of an environment. Some people dismiss reinforcement learning as an example of outdated 20th century behaviorism. I and my colleagues disregard this criticism, and many would agree that reinforcement learning provides one of the most insightful and impactful frameworks for understanding a host of problems broadly related to decision-making and planning. As alluded to, a central idea in decision-making is that of an internal model. And arguably the very first person to articulate a well-defined notion of an internal model was Kenneth Craig. Kenneth Craig was a Scottish-born philosopher and psychologist who summarized his ideas in a famous book called The Nature of Explanation, published in 1943 two years before he died tragically in Cambridge in a bicycle accident at the age of 31. It's worth reading uh, what he had to say. So Craig said in a famous statement that if an organism carries a small scale model of external reality and of its own possible actions in its head, it's able to try out various alternatives, conclude which is the best of them, react to future situations before they arise, utilize the knowledge of past events in dealing with the present and future, and in every way react in a more fuller, safer, and much more competent manner to the emergencies which face it. The key ideas, therefore, in this notion are ideas of prediction, simulation, and memory access. And these ideas are going to be the focus of my lecture. If we start with prediction, prediction is now recognized as crucial for learning in the sense that a violation of a prediction generates a quantity or signal that we refer to as a prediction error. In simple terms, a prediction error quantifies a discrepancy between an expectation and an outcome. And this drives learning by updating one's future expectations. In reinforcement learning, this is referred to as updating an action value. Now we now know the prediction error for reward, for example, is expressed through the action of the neurotransmitter dopamine. And we can measure its response in parts of the brain as demonstrated here called the ventral striatum, which is a dopamine rich area of the brain. The question is whether these prediction errors are manifest when a decision is generated by a goal-directed or habitual type of action. Using various psychological experiments, as shown here on the left, we can quantify the degree to which an action which a person performs is habitual or goal-directed, and then ask a question, is a prediction error generated by both of these controllers? And the answer is yes. We see a prediction error for a habitual controller and for a model-based controller in exactly the same part of the brain. While prediction errors are important for updating our model of the world, the core of mental models is that they enable us to make inferences through mental simulation and guidance of memory search. And these two ideas are illustrated here in this slide. In the example on the left, I can work out the likely consequences of taking one of the five possible paths by a process of simulation based upon a model of the environment. On the right, in order to figure out the next best move within the allowed time in chess, I have to deal with the huge potential search space of possible moves. I can optimize this or improve this if I have some mechanism that can limit this search space, one that allows what we would call prioritized memory access. 
A more prosaic example of this might be a situation where I personally often lose my keys in my house. I live in a relatively large house, therefore the search space is huge. However, I have a well-formed model of myself and I usually know where my own propensities lie and I can limit the search space to the usual suspect of places where I have lost my keys. In neuroscience, the notion of mental models are considered most often in the context of spatial navigation tasks in rodents, as shown here on the left. Particularly so with reference to the activity of cells in the hippocampus called place cells. Now these are cells that code the current location of an animal in trajectory, and were first described by my colleague John O'Keefe back in the 1970s. This is illustrated on the left, where firing of hippocampal cells are seen to code the particular position of the animal in a trajectory. On the right, I'm showing an illustration of the human hippocampus. The human hippocampus is shown to be crucial for memory, particularly autobiographical memory, which can be thought of as a map of the past, prospective memory, which can be thought of as a map of the future, and what we term relational memory, which is an ability to map arbitrary associations between objects and events. An emerging idea, therefore, is that the same neural structures that enable spatial and autobiographical memory may also be relevant for supporting a mental model. To take this example, the idea is that the very same neural system organizes abstract relationships, such as the arbitrary relationship between objects in a grid structure. This notion of a graph-like ordering for cognition speaks to an old idea in philosophy of mind associated with the 19th century American pragmatist philosopher, Charles Peirce. Peirce said that reasoning is a process by which a human forms a diagram of that state of things, perceives in the parts of the diagram, relations not explicitly mentioned in the premises, satisfies itself by mental experiments upon the diagram, that these relations would always subsist or at least would do so in a certain proportion of cases, and concludes their necessary or probable truth. We can identify how the brain such, supports such an abstract map using a technique called functional MRI, which measures activity over the whole of the brain in high spatial resolution and relatively good temporal resolution. In an experiment carried out by my student, Mona Garvard, we present human participants with strings of objects as shown down here on the left. Unbeknownst to the participants in the experiment, the transitions between the objects were drawn from random walks through this graph-like structure. The relational rule was that the only objects that were directly connected on the grid could follow another presented object. Now, importantly, subjects were totally unaware of the graph-like structure. All they saw was this string of presented objects repeatedly. On a second day, which we call the experimental day, where we scanned subjects, we presented subjects with a much more restricted set of objects. Here, the transitions were now arbitrary. Our reasoning was that any brain region that encoded a map-like representation should show sensitivity to the distance between items on the grid and their connectedness. On the upper part of the slide, I'm showing you a map using fMRI of brain areas that showed sensitivity to these metrics of connectedness and distance. The areas I highlight are medial temporal lobe structures incorporating the hippocampus, which I showed earlier, and related interrhinal areas of the medial temporal cortex. Below, I'm showing a graph of activity measured from these same regions. And what this shows in a nutshell is that these brain regions encode sensitivity both to distance and to connectedness.
consistent with the idea that these areas of the brain organized abstract relational information in a map-like manner. So while this example identifies neural structures involved in building a map-like representation, one limitation is that it doesn't inform us about the actual physiological mechanism. One mechanism that we become particularly interested in is the remarkable neural phenomenon called neural replay. Here, play cells in the hippocampus, which I've already outlined, which fire when an animal travels through a particular trajectory, will also fire spontaneously and sequentially when an animal is at rest after it's run a trajectory. So in the example, imagine the animal running this trajectory, play cells are identified by distinct colors. On the right is a replay of cells recorded from the hippocampus when the animal is at rest. A number of features are noteworthy. Firstly, the firing pattern is highly structured and recapitulates the behavioral trajectory that the animal has taken. If you imagine this, recapitulates this trajectory here. The second thing is that this replay can be in a forward direction or in a backward direction. The forward direction of replay is often seen when an animal is planning to run this type of trajectory. The reverse replay is often seen when the animal has navigated a trajectory and is subsequently at rest. The question I've got is, does replay support map-like representations in the in human brain? And to address this, we needed to circumvent a particular problem, namely that we had no method to measure replay in humans. And secondly, replay had never been demonstrated in the human brain convincingly. So we turned to a technique called MEG. MEG has got very high temporal resolution, so measures brain activity in real time. And in work pioneered by Zeb Kurth Nelson when he was in my lab, we took the following uh, approach to tackling replay. Now it turns out that the core idea for measuring replay was anticipated by Kenneth Craig in The Nature of Explanation in 1943. When he said the following, he said, nervous systems contain conducting sensory and motor paths and synapses in which there are states of excitation and volleys of impulses which parallel the stimuli which occasioned them. So building on this core idea, we measured MEG activity while we presented subjects with distinct pictures. These distinct pictures would evoke patterns of brain activity, which we could measure on MEG. So here I'm showing you an example, example of activity elicited in all this, across all the sensors of an MEG recording machine in response to presentation of a tree. So the key notion then is that we use what are called classifiers. This is a machine learning type of approach that tries to recognize patterns of brain activity evoked by these individual objects as shown here. We can determine the classification accuracy, and this is again shown here on the right. In essence, what we ask is the following question. Given a recorded pattern of neural activity, can we predict the stimulus that evokes this activity? And what is seen here on the right is that we can show that there's very high accuracy in achieving this for activity recorded at approximately 200 milliseconds post stimulus presentation. In a final step, we use this approach to apply it to act brain activity that we've recorded in MEG, either at subjects while they're at rest after they've performed a task or whilst they're performing a task. And what we do is very simple. What we look at in the brain data is we look for whether the brain spontaneously generates representation of these objects. And this gives us what's termed a reactivation probability for each object at each 
time point of interest. We then perform what's called a sequenceness analysis. This quantifies whether the spontaneous neural reactivations of task stimuli, say stimulus A, B, C, or D, and D, are represented sequentially one after the other, consistent with the idea of replay. In an experimental context, we can then test whether an identified neural regularity conforms to an underlying hypothesis or predicted structure. So based upon this technical advance, we can address a question of the role in replay in structuring experience, a fundamental step in building a map-like representation. To accomplish this, my student, Yonze Lai, first trained subjects to learn how an underlying sequence of stimuli, as shown here on the bottom left, can be applied to novel pairs of stimuli. On a training day, we presented subjects with pairs of stimuli. And subjects had to infer how these pairs of pictures were embedded in these two structural sequences as shown at the bottom of the slide. During training, they were explicitly informed that in each visual sequence, only the first and last transitions corresponded to correct structural relationships, where these in turn belonged to two distinct sequences as shown at the bottom. Critically, subjects were never shown a complete sequence, structural sequence order. So subject's task was based upon their visual experience to infer this type of underlying structure corresponding to what is shown here on the bottom left and bottom right. Next, we acquire data while subjects are at rest and we apply the classifiers to this resting data, asking whether there's evidence of reactivation and if there's evidence of reactivation of representations of these stimuli, is there evidence also for sequenceness in this resting state activity? So there's two possibilities here, that if we see reactivation and sequenceness, it could conform to the visual sequence that subjects had during the training day, or equally, it, as it related to our hypothesis, it could correspond to these underlying structural sequences which subjects had to infer. What I'm showing you here is the finding. Here on the left, I'm showing you evidence for sequenceness. Above zero refers to forward sequenceness. Below zero refers to backward sequenceness. These dotted lines here refer to a very conservative statistical threshold. And what you can see is that there is evidence for sequenceness in a forward direction that exceeds the significant threshold between 20 to 60, with a 20 to 60 millisecond state to state lag. By what I mean by a state to state lag is that, for example, if there was evidence of reactivation of horse, it would be followed 20 to 60 seconds later by reactivation of a representation of feet, etc., etc. There was no evidence for reactivation of visual sequences. This study, however, had one potential confound, namely that subjects did see pairs of stimuli, and it is possible through some learning mechanism that they may have strung together these pairs in particular ways that could generate the finding we observed. This is rendered unlikely because we do a comparison with the visual presentation. To rule this out, we repeated the study, now giving a much more abstract set of instructions. So the experiment is exactly the same. We present subjects with sequences of objects, but now we tell them that um, the, for example, the first stimulus here would correspond to the fourth stimulus of a particular underlying sequence. And for the second stimulus, it could, we might tell them the rule was that it corresponded to the fourth position of a first sequence. 
So it was a much more abstract type of instruction. We again scanned subjects while they were at rest, and then we tested them as to their knowledge, as to whether an object was in the first sequence or the second sequence, and tested them also to which position in the sequence it occurred. So there are two possibilities again. We might see activity related to the underlying structural sequence or to the underlying visual sequence. What we do is we have replicated the finding exactly as in the first study, showing the presence of sequenceness, but only for the underlying structure, not for the order of visual experience. Now, one striking finding here is that the impact of structural knowledge, how these stimuli or states relate to each other or are strung together, influences replay, raising the question whether structural knowledge itself might be a component of a replayed representation. For example, position might be represented explicitly during replay, such that the third items of each structural sequence, sequence one and two, would share part of their replayed representation. And it's the same thing for each sequence. So just to summarize, we train a classifier now, not on the stimulus, but in this time point here where we are testing subjects as to their knowledge, we train them on a classifier that will recognize sequence, either se sequence one or sequence two, irrespective of the stimuli that make up that sequence. And we train them on a position code, say here, position three, irrespective of the stimulus into which sequence it belongs. Now, the notion that there might be such coding of structural information might seem quite fantastic. But in fact, again, it is an old idea which can be referred back to this figure here on the left. It is an image of Willem von Humboldt, the elder brother to the equally famous Alexander von Humboldt. He proposed 200 years ago that the root of high level cognition involves the infinite use of finite means. This is often taken as the earliest statement of a principle of combinatorial generalization in linguistics, but is one that can be applied equally to cognition in general. When we apply our trained classifiers for sequence and position, our structural classifiers to the resting data, what we show is that there's evidence both for a position code shown here and for a sequence code shown here. And crucially, these position and sequence codes appear 50 milliseconds on average before a corresponding stimulus code. So to put this in the context of the experiment, when subjects are replaying, say, horse or feet, prior to replay of that representation, there will be replay of a sequence and position code preceding it. And likewise for feet, et cetera, et cetera. And this is shown graphically here. So this is in red, a sequence code, this is a position code, and this is a stimulus code, showing you that a sequence and position code are activated 50 milliseconds on average in advance of the corresponding sequence code. One final thing from this study is the question of the origin of this sequenceness or this replay. And from rodent data, we know that spontaneous offline replay occurs within high frequency bur bursts, 120 to 200 hertz, of local field potential known as sharp wave ripples. We asked whether there was evidence for sharp wave ripples in our data. Individual replay events provide the trigger for defining moments where there is a high probability of stimulus reactivation. And what we show in study one and study two is that there is indeed evidence for sharp wave ripples coinciding with onset of replay. This shows that we can identify clusters 
with high levels of significance. And on the right, we can show that this localizes to the hippocampus, the brain area that we know from animal studies is critical for replay and for encoding of map-like representations of the world. So having shown that replay in humans accounts for an ordering of experience, we're next interested in whether replay contributes to the type of inference needed when we make decisions that exploits a model of the world. Specifically, situations where you have no direct experience and where the goal is to maximize reward. In essence, this addresses the question of how models endow us with an ability to learn effectively from limited experience and generalize this knowledge effectively to negotiate new situations. And these are two ideas that are core to Craig's notion of mental models. So I'm gonna give you an example. Imagine you're at a traffic jam and you have traveled this route every day and every time you get caught in this terrible jam, you will immediately know that this is a bad route. But you'll equally know that these other routes that you haven't traveled are equally bad because they're also likely to lead to the same problem or will lead to the same problem. So we can formalize this example in the following way. Imagine you're to start from the blue position as I show here for the mouse, and your job is to take either the left or right path to get to a place where you will get a reward or get nothing. If I take the left path and get a reward, I can update the value of that action and more, I'm more likely to repeat it. So this is an example of local learning. The issue is how do we propagate that knowledge to a map of the environment that the animal or I may have, namely a map that tells me that there are other common paths that converge on this reward and other paths that don't converge on it. In other words, how is local learning or credit assignment achieved in the brain? So I'm going to talk about two forms of learning. On the right, local learning. At the top here, I'm going to talk about non-local learning. To address this, we designed an experiment similar to the example I've outlined. There are three starting states, which I'm henceforth going to call arms, each with all two alternative choice paths. Each end state leads to a reward with the probability that slowly drifted over time. The important feature was that the two end states were reachable by three from the three starting states. So X was reachable by going C1, C2, C3, or E1, E2, E3, or A1, A2, A3, and Y achievable by these alternative paths. A key feature of the design is it allowed subjects to use reward feedback to inform their choices, including what choices they might make when they started from another starting state at the next trial. In reinforcement learning, such non-local value propagation can be achieved by leveraging a model of the environment to enable simulation of potential trajectories. And this can substitute for direct experience, a process called experience replay. And if this type of experience replay supports non-local value learning, then there's another issue. It's statistics should be relevant for a second question. Given the limited availability of time and resources, which of the myriad possible actions should be prioritized and replayed? In principle, a reward maximizing agent should prioritize replay of those experiences that are most likely to improve future choices and thereby earn more rewards. Our behavioral findings were as follows. If you look down on the right here, we can look at the probability of repeating the same action if you're rewarded on the last trial, as opposed to not rewarded. And this is shown down here. We can see that the probability of performing the same action is greatly enhanced if I was rewarded on the last trial. 
what if I reward on the last trial, but now I start at a different arm? Am I likely to choose a path leading to the reward as opposed to a path that doesn't lead to the reward? If I use a model of the task, I should have boosting of choices for a path leading to reward as opposed to not leading to reward. And that is exactly what we see. On the left here, we can use computational models to characterize this behavior in a more fine-grained manner. And the two key findings, the first is if we look at local learning versus non-local learning, whether the learning rate for both of those is equivalent. And that is exactly what we find. And crucially, in respect of the question of whether there's prioritization of uh, replay, we find that there's greater learning for a high compared to a low priority arm. We can next turn to the neural data and ask how the observed non-local learning is achieved in the brain by testing for sequential reactivation at the point of outcome receipt, a time period where new learning occurs. And this is an analogous to the time when, say example, a rodent consumes a reward. On the left two panels, I'm showing you the decoding accuracy. On the right, what I'm showing is significant forward replay, which peaks at 30 milliseconds, state-to-state -state lag, and backward replay that peaks at 160 milliseconds, state-to-state -state lag. So these two types of replay are seen at the point of outcome. We can then dissect these two forms of replay to ask very important questions, namely whether replay of a 30 millisecond or 160 millisecond have different representational contents. And what we show for 30 milliseconds is that it represents local paths, but not no, non-local paths. And 160 millisecond represents non-local, but not local paths. Having identified then two forms of learning, we tested whether baseline learning rate for each non-local path was significantly increased on trials when that path expressed significant neural replay or not. So this is shown here in terms of a formalized reinforcement learning model. And just to summarize the data in the interest of time, we show that there is boosting of learning rates in the presence versus the absence of 160 millisecond backward replay. And this is not seen for 30 millisecond replay. And finally, we ask whether neural replay itself is prioritized to favor the more useful experiences. So here we can define different priorities, higher priority versus lower priority local paths. And what we find is summarized here, that there is a significant boosting of replay for high priority as opposed to low priority paths. And this is shown graphically here, indicating that this is only seen for the 160 millisecond replay, but not for the 30 millisecond replay. For the last part of the lecture, I want to turn to a situation where an emerging theoretical notion is that there is a breakdown in the ability to form a veridical model of the world. Here I'm talking about the tragic condition of schizophrenia. In work carried out by my student, Matthew Neuer, he performed a study looking at patients with schizophrenia using the type of task that I showed right at the beginning. Crucially, patients and controls were able to learn this task though patients struggled to learn it as well as controls, though at the end of the experiment, they had acquired the task structure. This difference in learning is just illustrated here between patients and controls. What I'm showing here is differences in sequences in patients and controls. In the upper left, what I'm showing you is that controls show the pattern of sequences we have shown before, in the studies I've already outlined. Namely, they show forward sequenceness with a state-to-state -state lag of 20 to 60 milliseconds. This is completely absent in patients. They do not show evidence of replay. 
And this is just showing that there is a significant difference in replay pre-learning, post-learning. So there is a significant interaction. In other words, controls show replay, but patients do not. And lastly, what is shown down here is that we show that there is a relationship between the efficiency of learning, as defined by what we call relative learning lag, and the presence of sequenceness. So less sequenceness, poor learning, as characterize the patients. So to summarize, our brains carry small-scale reality, a model of reality that enables prediction, simulation, and prioritization of memory access. I've shown this is encoded in regions such as hippocampus and related medial temporal structures. Neurophysiological evidence indicates neural replay is fundamental to building and revising this small-scale model, to use the language of Craig, as a function of direct and indirect experience. And lastly, we provide evidence that this mental model is deficient in patients with schizophrenia, evident in impaired replay. And finally, I want to come to acknowledgements, thanking my students, fellows and colleagues at UCL Max Planck Center for Computational Psychiatry and Aging, and give specific thanks to those who've done the work, particularly those here in the upper row. Yunzi Liu, a PhD student of mine, Mona Garvard, a former PhD student of mine, Marcello Matar, a collaborator who is now based in the West Coast of USA, and Matthew Noor, a PhD student of mine. In the bottom are long-term collaborators, Zeb Kurth Nelson, a former postdoc and now at DeepMind, Tim Burns, a collaborator who's based in Oxford and at UCL, and again, a long-term collaborator, Nathaniel Dole, who's based at Princeton uh, in the USA. I'd like to end with a quote from Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, 99 parts of all things that proceed from the intellect are plagiarisms, pure and simple, and the lesson ought to make us modest, but nothing can do that. Thank you very much for your attention. Ray, thank you so much for an absolutely outstanding Ferrier Prize lecture. And again, my congratulations. It was wonderful. I'd also like to thank the Royal Society team for making this online event so far run so very smoothly. And to all of you viewers for joining us and staying with us. So please do use Slido, use the link to ask questions, raise items for discussion. And we have several interesting um, questions already. So the first one is regarding the replay decoding experiments, given their temporal precedence, would you agree that sequence and position codes might function as internal cues for reactivating the object representation? Um, thanks for the question. Um, I, you slightly broke up, Linda, but I think I've got the, the gist of it. Um, and the, the, just to repeat the question, that the question was whether the position code and the sequence code acted as a template. Is that right? For yes. uh, and I, th that's absolutely correct. So there is a general notion that perhaps these codes might perform something like a building block for replaying of experience. And one way you might think about this in a simple term is imagine a reel of film. Um, each still film that makes up the real, real film, so in a movie, will have a particular stamp or its, uh, it, it, its particular position. It will also have a temporal order code. So something like that, I think, might be at play here, and that these codes provide a sort of building block on which other features of experience are sort of glued onto. Here, the sensory code, what was the object? But that could be sort of generalized to many other types of situation. So if I go back to the quote, which I do like of, of Wilhelm von Humboldt, that um, the infinite use of finite means that maybe the root of cognition is not some something very highly complex, but the use of very simple motives produced in very creative ways or in with sort of a combinatorial wizardry. 
I was curious whether you're, in your research you study gender differences, for instance, like differing abilities across genders in replay activities. And by the way, thank you. This has been a very interesting lecture. Thank you. Um, that's always a very interesting question, whether there, there are gender differences. And I have to say that we haven't studied partly because this is very new sort of work. And so the first sort of variables we look at will be variables related to, you know, can we demonstrate it? What does it account for? Um, now, you might speculate <laughs> that uh, I always say myself that um, um, men have very short memories and women have very long memories. So you might, you might, you might speculate that perhaps uh, women may have um, more replay, uh, but who knows? Um, I, I, we, we haven't looked at that. It hasn't been looked at in animals either. Uh, and such studies are very complicated to do because you need very large samples. And again, these are very time consuming experiments, require a lot of um, um, data analysis, et cetera. But, you know, it's a very interesting question. And at, as yet, we have no idea. So the next one is, again, thanks very much for such an interesting lecture. Can I ask how dopamine relates to replay. Do you get more replay when there is more dopamine? Well, that's a really good question. Um, so uh, I pointed out earlier on that when you get a, a reward, you get a, uh, a spurt of dopamine coming into lots of, I showed it into the striatum, but you also get it into areas like the hippocampus, which is the origin of replay. Now, dopamine neurons originate in the brainstem and um, they uh, release activity, in, uh, uh, release uh, dopamine over widespread areas of the brain. So there's three answers to that. First, we know that dopamine is very important for memory, for chaining individual components of experience together, for the plasticity that mediates that. So that's the first thing. The second thing we know from recent work done in animals that dopamine is very important for the expression of theta. And I highlighted that in the type of inference where you learn, I've gone down this road as a traffic jam. I know now in the future, I don't go down the other roads converging there. I learned that without experience. Dopamine, if you block it, you get diminished theta. If you enhance it, you get boosted theta. So it's related there. And uh, in the United States, Matt Wilson has looked at the coupling between representation of reward in dopamine cells in the VTA and the expression of replay and showed that they are tightly coupled, particularly when you're replaying an experience that is related to uh, the likelihood of getting a reward at the end of that experience. So it's a very interesting topic. It's just been explored uh, and they're very tightly related, but I think there's still an awful lot to understand about it. Another interesting one. How is replay related to conscious experience? Are we aware of our own replay activity? Oh, great question. Uh, so um, if you look at the type of replay we've demonstrated, say, in the, in the cell experiment that Yunze Lu showed, um, replay occurs with sort of a state-to-state -state, uh, transition of 30 to 50 milliseconds. That's very, very fast, probably outside are, are faster than sort of we, we think. The 160 seconds where you have to do this inference uh, from your local experience to more distal experiences. So I'm now learning that the traffic jam I've just experienced, I can update my, uh, my model of the other routes that come in there. That occurs at 160 millisecond state to state lag. So that's within the, the boundaries of sort of what my, one might think of as conscious experience. But there's a deeper aspect, I think, to the question, which relates to the fact that replay has been hypothesized or abnormalities of replay, perhaps to underpin the abnormal thoughts and experience that people have in a recurrent way, particularly in situations like depression. So a very common type of phenomenon of people who are upset and depressed is they wake up at night and they start ruminating. Uh, you start, and I think everybody has experienced this, you know, something's on your mind and you think about it 
and you're repeating the, the whole thing. And then you say to yourself, I'm not going to think about this anymore. I'm going to think about something else. And 10 seconds later, you're back. So replay has got some echoes of that. So the phenomenology is quite similar. Uh, and this is a very active area of research. People examining how replay might relate to rumination. And of course, if we know how replay is controlled, for example, if we know that certain neuromodulatory systems might be important, then it might give us some insight to how we could sort of manage and treat people where rumination is a, uh, a major problem in, in, in their lives. And rumination, by the way, is often sort of an early symptom of depression. It starts with ruminations and then people fall into a state. So it's, it's an interesting potential target. Thank you much, very much for an interesting lecture. Regarding the structural learning, do you have any insight into how and when these representations are formed, how plastic they are, and what, if any role, object or scene categories might play in their success? Yeah, if I understand the, the, the question, I think the, these representations are formed almost immediately uh, because we know that, uh, for example, if we take memory, uh, episodic memory, uh, our ability to remember very specific instances, we can form those memories with one shot experience, very brief, just a fleeting glance of something, and we have a representation of it. So the answer is that these memories seem to be representations formed pretty immediately. Now the question becomes, how, how are they those rep representations maintained? And one way might be through the process of replay. You Replay might be a way of consolidating representations into long-term memories. And if you have a value system that's interacting with that process, then the likelihood is that you will retain more valuable memories and discard the ones that are not so valuable. Um, so the evidence is that these representations are formed, if I understand the question correctly, pretty instantaneously and immediately. And you know, I think we have that experientially as well. People often just witness something for a second that's very traumatic and that troubles them uh, you know for many years down the line as in PTSD. Oh, here's one close to my own heart. Could you speculate on the effects of aging on replay? Yeah um, I could and I, I, th this is really interesting I think because uh, not because you're there Linda but uh, I think, you know, we know that there is an age-related decline in memory. We know that that age-related decline does parallel the age-related decline in the levels of dopamine you see in your brain. So if you do post-mortem studies of people who've died in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, not from brain diseases, you see that there's a linear decrease in the level of dopamine. And we know that, you know, your memory and cognition after the age of 55 begins to drop off in some more steep than others. Um, so I think this probably is, is, is a, a very strong relationship and that an intriguing thing, there's two, two possibilities. One is that age-related decline in cognition may relate to the absence of that dopamine uh, modulatory input. And another level of question here is perhaps something like replay may be very important as a kind of an early marker of people who go on to develop um, dementia, where uh, I'm thinking particularly of Alzheimer's, where uh, you can imagine that one of the earliest things to go is memory, but actually people reflect that other things go before that. People begin to have problems stringing their experience together, get confused in terms of the temporal order of experience. So I think there's a very interesting potential story here related to replay and its role and how easily it is compromised and how early it's compromised in neurodegenerative diseases. What treatment possibility for schizophrenia would you see related to the neural replay deficit? How could we target it? Yeah, um, well, one, one thing that, you know, would may seem slightly contradictory in, in it, so just to recap, in schizophrenia, there's the work of Matthew Neuer. Uh, Matthew has shown that there is a deficit of, of replay, 
But uh, data I didn't show is that in the hippocampus, there is an exuberance of that high powered, uh, high frequency activity that I, sh that I showed was associated with sharper ripples. So, um, and although I didn't show that da data in the interest of time, one interesting idea might be interventions that um, target that over exuberance of short wave ripples. And it's interesting that dopamine here, which is implicated in schizophrenia, uh, it's the oldest hypothesis in the books on schizophrenia. And we know the treatment of schizophrenia involves blocking dopamine with, and, uh, with dopamine blocking drugs. So it may be that one way that these drugs might be acting is, um, and of course we don't know this as a body of knowledge to motivate treatment, is they may be controlling that over exuberance of sharp wave ripples that we see in patients with schizophrenia and which is associated with aberrant um, or a failure of um, sequential replay that we see in normal subjects. I think we've got, there are so many questions, but I think we've got time for just one more. During neural re replay, will people need past experience or if those that don't have past experience, freeze, flight or fight? Yeah, um, so I think I'd, I'd take this back into kind of um, uh, a, a, having a model of the world. Uh, now, I do like the work of Craig and his notion of building a that we all carry a model of the world in, in, in our brains. And that world, that model is not just a model of the layout of my house, but it's also encapsulate things of my, my relationships and who I'm close to, who I'm not close to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we come to every experience with this kind of model and people who are interested in, 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 in high level theories of the brain often say, treat this as a notion of the Bayesian brain. We come with our sort of priors. Um, if you didn't have any past experience, uh, you wouldn't have any of these expectations that help in many ways to reduce the search space, uh, helps me reduce where I look for my keys around the house, but also re helps reduce, you know, what is the likely causes of the experiences I'm having out there uh, in time. So I think if you did not have past experiences, you you would have real problems. And I think you may have real problems just ordering your replay in any sort of sequential way that, that we showed. For some reason, the, the, the movie, or sorry, the, the, the question makes me think of the movie by Christopher Nolan, which uh, uh, an ex-graduate, I think of UCL, um, whose name I can't remember, but it's about a man who uh, lost his memory. He had memento, I think, yeah. Uh, so he, that's an example, uh, a very good example of, um, what your experience would like uh, uh, would be. He could not interpret his ongoing experience in an appropriate way because he no longer had access to his past experiences and his life was utterly chaotic. <laughs> okay, well, on that note, Ray, um, thank you again for an absolutely wonderful lecture. You can tell by the multiple questions that have come in and there, there are still some there. Um, the level of interest. Uh, thank you very much, the viewers, for your questions, for your interest, for staying with us. And again, Ray, my congratulations on the Ferrier Prize lecture. It was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to the Royal Society and thank you for everybody who uh, joined this evening. <laughs>